Good evening and welcome to the Crocker Art Museum. My name is Houghton Kinsman and I'm the Adult Education Coordinator here at the museum. Before we begin tonight's program, I'll read a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the Crocker Art Museum is on the traditional land of the Nisanan people and the current state of California is the homeland of many tribes. We are honored to be here today and acknowledge our responsibility to these native nations and our commitment to work with them as we move forward as an inclusive institution. So I want to thank you all for joining us here this evening. Uh, we're really excited to be hosting tonight's program uh, entitled A Critic and a Chef. Um, a new series at the Crocker, A Critic and a Chef, explores the overlaps between visual culture and the culinary arts. Tonight, I'm joined by Sacramento Bee food writer Benji Eagle and co-owner and executive chef at Kadaiko Ramen and Bar, Takume Abe, to discuss how these dynamics unfold in the farm to fork capital. Before we welcome Benji and Takumi to the virtual stage, a few quick housekeeping notes. This program's uh, evening's program will be available to view again on YouTube. Uh, please use the chat for any comments or questions you'd like us to answer. Um, our new art interactive is also available, so grab your copy uh, or visit our website at crockerart.org uh, for more information on upcoming fall programs. I also want to thank all of our members and attendees today for your continued support. Your support, along with those who have donated to tonight's program and those of you who have turned up in numbers to attend this program, is a constant reminder of the generosity of our museum community. So thank you all. Now, on to the program. Born and raised in Palo Alto, Takume Abe's enthusiasm for food started at a young age. In his 25-year career, he has worked in Malmo, Sweden, Boulder, Colorado, San Francisco, California, and Tokyo, Japan, before coming to Sacramento. He is influenced by his Japanese and Swedish American upbringing and the seasons of Northern California and the traditions of everyday food. Open in Sacramento in 2019, Kodaiko is a seasonally influenced Japanese American restaurant with a focus on ramen made from scratch and craft cocktails. Next up is Benji Eagle. Eagle is a Sacramento Bee's food and beverage reporter. Born in Sacramento and raised mostly in Davis, he joined the Bee as a breaking news reporter in 2017. He's a James Beard Award Judge, a Cal Poly Journalism Department Advisory Board member, and a suck of a stone fruit in the Sacramento Sun. So welcome, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's great to be cool. here. How are you guys doing? Good. Fantastic. Good. You had a good week so far? Good week, yeah. It's uh, finally cooled off a little bit. So yeah. Everyone Enjoy that. yeah. Enjoying the nice, cool weather, right? Buck, it's been a busy week at the restaurant? It has been. Yeah, it has been. Um, it's, uh, you know, now that the weather's cooling off and the, the months that end in BER tend to be 
this year. So yeah. we're, we're heading into the season for ramen. Well, I want to thank you both for being here tonight. Um, I'm really excited to kind of jump into some questions around the food industry and restaurants and sort of how that overlaps with uh, visual culture and visual art. Um, so I thought I'd kick off with an introductory question for both of you. Uh, where did your love for food and restaurants begin? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, from young age, yeah, from a young age, I've always been about in, very interested in food and captivated by food. Um, you know, of course, uh, we can all. Well, I can look back to my mom, my grandmother. Um, my mom, even though she had a full-time career, uh, she pretty much cooked everybody. Uh, so uh, I think that had an influence on my love of food, for sure. Um, and my grandmother as well. Uh, she was food with her a lot, and she grew up in rural Pennsylvania, so everything she did was very seasonally influenced um, as well. And for you, Benji? Yeah, my uh, my mom and my grandma and my dad as well all had a really sizable impact on me at a young age as far as food. Um, but the f moment that really stands out after college, I uh, my first job in journalism was in rural Texas, and I was a thousand miles from anyone I knew. Uh, there was a lot of culture shock going on. Uh, it wasn't a city with a lot of other twenty-two year olds. Was, you know, I, I had no friends out there basically. And um, food became sort of a self-care mechanism for me that, you know, I remember putting like this Southern pork uh, rib with the country apple slaw, you know, concoction in the crock pot in the morning and, you know, having a hard day at work, but thinking that that's going to be there at the end of it, you know, getting more experimental with my own cooking, seeking out, you know, interesting restaurants in the city I was in, uh, meeting people that way. And, um, for me, I think that's when I really started seeing cooking as, you know, a form of nourishment, um, both mentally and physically, and uh, more of a manner of expression when I would go to those, you know, other restaurants, because um, they're often run by people who, uh, you know, didn't fit the mold of a small town, Texas type of person. So, yeah, that'd be cool to see. Um, yeah, I, yeah. So, um, my, one of my earliest memories of well i should say the first thing that i really loved eating was um we lived on the stanford campus in a dormitory my mom was a grad student at stanford and uh, the dorm was called east house and it was an east asian focused uh situation and the cook was chinese and my favorite thing well you know i was three years old but i still remember having chow fun and just being in love with those soft flesh noodles. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because that was sort of my next question. Was there like an aha moment for you when it came to deciding to move into the restaurant or food industry? Or was it sort of like a gradual um, evolution? Yeah, so there yeah, there were several for me. I, I mean, some, or I, yeah, there were a few that um, when I was younger, my good friend, Jonah Cool, his mother, well, his, both his parents, really, they were separated. They both had their own restaurants. Yeah. Um, Jesse Cool uh, owned Fleece and still does Flea Street Cafe in Menlo Park. Um, and when I would go sleep over at his house, we would go work at the restaurant. We would like this, you know, we were probably 10 years old. Uh, we would plate desserts and uh, sat make salads. And then at the end of the night, we'd have uh, sit on the back stoop with the cooks and eat a meal. And that was, um, you know, that it really intrigued me that I was interested in and I loved food and eating bef far before that. But that really was comforting to me. It felt like I like I sense like I felt very comfortable and and felt like I belonged in that setting. And for you, Benji? I guess my journey to become a food writer was a little, uh, it was more gradual uh, 
I started interning at the newspaper in Davis when I was 15, covering sports for them. That's yeah. what I thought I wanted to do. I did that for a few years and into college. Um, and then, you know, started doing other journalism beats, studying journalism in school, um, broke out to be a business reporter and then a breaking news reporter at the B. And about six months after I was hired as a breaking news reporter, my editors came to me and said, okay, we don't have anyone covering restaurants or bars at the moment. And, um, I don't know why they picked me. I'm still trying to figure that out. But they asked if I'd be interested in trying it as sort of a one-month trial, a sprint, they call it. Um, and mind you, at the time, I was getting in at 5.30 in the morning every day to cover, like, homicides and all kinds of other grisly stuff. And, you know, they were asking me to, to get paid to go eat around Sacramento. And, you know, who turned that down? Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, I started doing it and kind of, you know, was attracted from the food aspect, but really – fell in love with the storytelling that you can do on this beat and that, you know, all the diversity of Sacramento that's expressed in kitchens and all the, the different stories that you can tell through the lens of food. Um, so it was kind of a slow burn for me, if you will. Um, I, I've fallen for it at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that you brought up the idea of uh, sort of storytelling through food and um, through restaurants, because I mean, that's kind of the progression we're going to make over the next hour is kind of look at how food and restaurants kind of, I guess in, in a way, paint a portrait of, the, of their cities. Um, but I mean, to sort of get us started, I wanted to go a little bit behind the scenes and kind of ask you both um, a little bit about what a regular day-to-day -day looks like for you. Chuck, do you want to take this one first? What's, what's uh, life like in the kitchen? Sure, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's busy and cooking in a lot of food uh, at a high volume. So, um, yeah, in the morning we get a lot of soup started early um, and you can see in the picture here there's some roasted vegetables there's a, some of our soup that's our tonkotsu broth going into its final of three stages um, on the left uh, so yeah i mean we're ramen shop we make four different broths um, and we turn that into 11 different kinds of ramen so there's soup going constantly, all the time. Um, on the right is a picture of, uh, of, a, of a private dinner that we did um, during the pandemic. Uh, where we were trying to, you know, do a little, do, try to experiment some, with some different things to see um, if we could get some more people in the door. I mean, that's one of the things we were talking about kind of, you know, just before the program started about how the running a restaurant is so multifaceted. It's not just about like dine in. I mean, there's the takeout component. I mean, private events. I've been thinking a little bit about, you know, some of the components of the food industry that like an average restaurant goer might not know about. What sort of things stand out to you? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. I think, yeah. I think, I mean, uh, you know, I think the cost of everything um and the breakdown and the the margins being so slim that as a business uh restaurants don't really make a lot of sense uh, but it they do make sense in the in if you think about that everyone wants to eat everyone has to eat and people like eating new and exciting things mm -hmm. and maybe going out and not having to cook for themselves or having to clean up for themselves um obviously these are reasons why we all go out to eat um but yeah i think you know the idea that you can go to a really busy restaurant that is consistently busy all the time and it could actually be losing money hmm. you know um uh through you know mismanagement or or for several several factors um but i think one thing that people don't really that they might not think about is the cost and the work that goes into not just the food but the overall experience um, uh, on a day in day out basis. Yeah, so like as a as a customer, we would receive something like we we're seeing on the screen right now, but there's so many different stages before it arrives, um, sort of at our hands, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Benji, what does a what does a regular day look like for you? And sort of um, 
what are the components from a food writer's perspective that people might not know about? Sure. Um, so typically the first thing I do to start my day off is some form of exercise and <laughs> looking at the photo on the screen, you can see why that's an essential yeah. part of the, uh, the occupation, I think, uh, to mm -hmm. avoid, you know, to, to do this for a long time, not just a good time. Uh, but, you know, from there, I, my, my beat is like any other reporters. I'm, I'm checking in with my editor. I'm, you know, scrounging the internet for tips. I, you know, sometimes have sources who want to talk to me on background or I need to make calls to do interviews. Um, I'll typically try and get a lot of the, uh, the talking to people stuff out of the way in the morning, making the calls or, you know, fielding calls or what have you. Um, and then, I'll usually break for lunch, go out somewhere or, you know, stay in and then try and write throughout the afternoon and try and, you know, get all my thoughts together and into a, a story. Um, from there, you know, I, I eat out for dinner a few nights a week. It depends on the work assignments I have. Some weeks it's six or seven nights a week. Uh, other weeks it's one or two. Uh, but I'm definitely trying to cast a broad net with that. And uh, so there could be a little drive involved within the Sacramento area. Um, yeah, to places like Pupuseria La Chicana, which is out in Woodland, but mm -hmm. delicious. Um, I mean, for both of you, like running a restaurant or, you know, food writing, I mean, the sort of the, the line blurs between regular life and one's job in a sense, right? I was thinking about, you know, Benji, you going for lunch. I mean, does that kind of qualify as, as work too? I mean, you know, it's the same thing for you, Tuck working in a restaurant, right? The family kind of grows up in the restaurant too. I mean, when you listen to the way chefs talk about how intense the work is, um, the restaurant kind of becomes like a, like an additional home. It's, it's more like an additional child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think. It's, uh, it's something that takes a lot of work that can cause great frustration and great joy. And, um, you know, changes with age as well. Um, uh, I don't know. That's the way that I uh, have grown to think about the restaurant. And I mean, it. you spend a lot of time in it, you know, so it's comfortable like your home for sure. But um, it's not relaxing like my home mm -hmm. is, even if my kids are, Juju and Omid are, are being uh, troublemakers. <laughs> it's still it's still relaxing place. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, I definitely notice a difference when I go out to eat for a review or for a story versus when I'm just going out with friends or family or what have you. Um, that you know, when I'm going out for a review, yeah, I'm, I'm having fun. I'm enjoying. I'm hopefully eating some good food. Uh, but I'm on my phone all the time, taking notes and taking pictures, and you know, it's still work. Um, and uh, you know, I, I try and balance that with, you know, leaving the office a couple hours early if I know I'm going to be uh, somewhere at night. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great job. It's, it's just still a job too, you know? Yeah. I mean, I wanted to kind of build on that and ask you a little bit about what your process is like for deciding sort of where you eat and what you eat. Yeah. So I have a list of like 80 some restaurants on the, you know, in, in my phone for the Sacramento area that I'm still hoping to check out that I haven't been to before. Um, I try and cast a really wide net as far as coverage, both in the types of restaurants that I review and the location. You know, I, I just went to Catherine's Beer Garden in Rockland, as you can see here. So I might not review another restaurant in Rockland for a couple months now because there's a lot of other cities with interesting cuisine to, uh, to go check out. Um, you know, as far as finding places, sometimes it's just looking online seeing what their menu has if there's you know dishes that i don't really see on a lot of restaurant menus around sacramento that'll definitely pop out you know that's something that i want to look at if they're doing like you know for example a type of japanese food that we don't really see at a lot of japanese restaurants mm -hmm. that's something we're digging into investigating that piques my curiosity a lot of it comes from you know folks just telling me where they've eaten around too, and you know if that grabs me. Takumi was telling me <laughs> yeah. well, about this about this like great taco truck with you know wonderful tripas, and you know now that's like part of the list too. That that's somewhere I want to go check out because you know I trust his taste. 
Um, and so, yeah, it's partially word of mouth, partially, uh, you know, what I find online as far as restaurant menus and, you know, also just what I see as I'm driving around, uh, you know, doing my job or just exploring Sacramento in my free time. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that sort of, how do you take like something that's so like sense based and turn it into words? I mean, it's like a, you know, you're sitting at the table at such a transitory moment. I mean, turning that into, you know, sort of a, 500, 800, or 1,000 word article, that must be pretty challenging. Yeah. Um, you know, when I'm at a meal, I, as I said earlier, I'm taking notes on my phone, but a lot of the time the notes are gibberish to someone who's not me. It's just like a list of how it's making me feel and what I'm tasting there, you know, and it's not complete sentences or anything like that. It's just really trying to tie into the emotion of the meal. And I find when I do that, that I can come back later and build in, you know, the proper grammar and spelling and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, that I have the nuts and bolts of the emotional uh, effect of the meal. And I think that for me, at least that shines through in my writing and that, you know, people can, uh, can pick up what I'm putting down a lot of the time. Um, you know, photos help a lot too, as they say, you know, a photo is worth a thousand words. So, um, you know, I, if I, I can talk about how great the schnitzel was at Catherine's Beer Garden. You can also see it on the plate there, just, you know, or the sausages or whatever's grabbing your eye from that photo. Um, but yeah, um, a lot of the time, you know, also the food itself gets a few paragraphs and the restaurant as a whole gets a lot more because, you know, that's what's on the table in front of us, but you can't see all the Bavarian decor that they have around this space. So you can't see that they have two patios or that, you know, Catherine Grossi immigrated from Germany. You know, she's a she's from there. So uh, there's a lot more story to tell, I think, besides just the flavor of the food going into your mouth, the texture, or what have you. Although I have to let you both know, it was a real challenge trying to compile this PowerPoint at four o'clock this afternoon, knowing I was only going to eat it like eight or nine. So <laughs> there was a lot of good stuff in the in those images. Um, I mean, my, my next question for both of you, and um, feel free to um, decide who wants to take it first, but I mean, do you see the work that you do as a creative endeavor? I, I mean, I definitely do. Yeah. Well, I mean, for one, we are actually creating things, right? Both of us. Um, and, but as far as create, you know, creativity goes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We try to, um, to come up with uh, things that differentiate us um, at Kodaiko from other ramen shops in town. Um, and uh, we have a, a, change, a menu that changes with the seasons or with the months, depending on um, how we're feeling. And I think that uh, keeps um, the guests and the, the customer base interested and um, that we keep changing things up, but it also keeps the cooks engaged and um, the wait staff as well, you know, and, um, you know, they, they want to, the wait staff wants to serve food they, that they are excited about. And if it's the same thing all the time, um, I think that's probably less likely. Yeah. But we were talking a little bit about that concept, I mean, in the build up to this, but I mean, when it, like with a painter it becomes known for a particular style or, you know, a particular um, artwork and it sort of gets repeated over and over. I mean, for some people to be able to continue in that vein is very possible, but for others not. I mean, how do you think about that as a chef talk, like, you know, having like a signature dish or something, something that's very popular for people? That's kind of being, you know, I guess, bold enough or brave enough to change it if that's what you feel like needs to happen creatively. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, uh, well, we try, at Kodeka, we try to keep things, we try to not repeat dishes that we've taken off the menu, um, even if they were really popular, uh, for the reasons that I said before, try to keep things fresh and exciting. Um, and we, as a staff, like that creative process um, and um, but you know when I think it is easy for um, chefs for restaurants 
to get pigeonholed mm-hmm. kind of for people to um, know you for one thing. And for example, for ramen, right? It's like I make ramen, I have a ramen restaurant, but I've only been making ramen for a small amount of time. But everyone and who I talk to or who knows me through that channel um, kind of just thinks that that's all I know how to cook, right? You know, or that's obviously that is what I specialize in now. But I, as far as my career goes, I haven't made ramen nearly as long as I've cooked, you know, California cuisine, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, or even Italian food, you know? I mean, but I grew up in a Japanese American household. I grew up eating ramen in Japan when I was a kid and, um, and here as well. And it is um, my most favorite food. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not the only thing that I can cook. Yeah. It might not even be the best thing that I can cook, yeah. to be honest, you know? Yeah, we, we got some good um, pictures of some home-cooked meals from the Abe household coming up later on in the slideshow. Um, but Benji, I wanted to throw the first question over to you. I mean, do you, do you think of the work that you do as sort of a creative endeavor? Not so much a creative endeavor. Um, a curious endeavor seems to fit better. I mean, mm-hmm. Takumi's right that you know we okay. do, do both create things. Um, but, you know, for me... I don't know. I mean, maybe it's that in journalism, you don't get creative with the facts or, you know, that curiosity is sort of what drives you to go out to a, investigate a story or find out what's going on. Um, but no, I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, de- I definitely feel a sense of wanting to know more, wanting to find out the story behind what I'm eating or what's happening in the restaurant scene, but it's sort of just feeding off of other people's curiosity more so than building my own, I guess, you know, we have projects at the B, you know, we have uh, new initiatives that we get going and that takes some curiosity that takes some thinking outside the box. But as far as my day-to-day work, you know, some, some creativity, I'm sorry. Uh, You know, I want to be creative in my sentence structure and, you know, how I convey thoughts, I guess. But um, no, I, I, would, I would say that, you know, creating the food itself is, is much more of a creative endeavor than, uh, than writing about it. Okay. Well, I mean, that's a pretty good segue into sort of our next uh, topic of discussion. I mean, when we met a few weeks ago to kind of plan this program, um, we talked a little bit about the balance between like the culinary arts and sort of food as sustenance. I mean, the food industry is uh, multifaceted, right? But the concept of food, too, is so multidimensional. Um, it provides an income for people. It helps keep us alive. But it is, in a way, a sense of, uh, of artistry. I mean, so how, how do you sort of both of you think about that balance between the culinary arts and sort of this uh, idea of food as sustenance? Tuck, seeing as we've got the Abe household um, dinner up here, why don't you take this one? Uh, okay, well... I mean, is is food an art form? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I, I, I think it it it, it can be. It can be. It does. It isn't always. Um, it art being a form of self expression, right? I think that food, if you are cooking something, it is to some degree a form of your self expression, um, a reflection of your past experiences and influences. Um, And um, if you have the wherewithal, then you're able to translate that uh, into food, I think. Um, But also, but it's not always like that, you know? uh, I think, how can I say this? If, If you are working in a restaurant where somebody is you know, has a freezer full of food and your instructions are to when someone orders this, you put it in the microwave for a certain amount of time and you take it out, you unwrap it, you can put it on a plate for somebody. Um, You know, there is no self-expression in certain, in in that case, you know, not, so not in all cases. Although I will say 
I think if you are cooking at home for your family, then there is always uh, a little bit of you in that food. So I think I mean, I love the image on the right here. I mean, it's the it's the food, but it's also sort of the art that goes underneath it. I mean, it's sort of really working together so well. That is my daughter Juju's. Uh, yeah, she was drawing on that and yeah. we served dinner right on that because <laughs> she didn't clear off the table. So <laughs> it was a pleasure. Sort of I love the juxtaposition of the the first, the last uh, two or three photos with with this photo. And Benji, I want to sort of turn that question over to you. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I think Takumi hit the nail on the head that, you know, I think of a place like Restaurant Josephine in Auburn, where all the dishware is like thrifted China. And it's a the menu is a mix of French and Eastern European cuisine, which is, you know, kind of the, the owner's backgrounds. And it's plated beautifully. A lot of the ingredients come from either their farm or farms in the area because one of the owners used to run the farmer's market up in Auburn. Um, and, you know, to me, that's that's a form of artistic expression. You know, it's, it's heritage and where they live now and, you know, who they are on the plates. Um, and that's food. And me shoveling chips into my mouth over the sink at 1 a.m. on a Saturday is also food, yeah. but that's not art. I mean, you know, there's, it can be sustenance and it can be art and it can be somewhere in the middle too. And it doesn't have to be super high end stuff like uh, restaurant Josephine or Laura to, to qualify as art. But um, I think that, you know, to be art, it needs to come from a place of thought and uh, consideration and you're really trying to express something with what you put on a plate or in a bowl. Um, and sometimes that's food, and sometimes food is just a little more baseline than that. You know, yeah. to feed yourself. I mean, kind of building on this idea of self-expression or expression, I mean, do you both consider food to be like sort of a language or, you know, a tool for communication? I, I've worked, well, I, in, in a sense, I've worked because I've worked in a few different countries like internationally and in both those instances I didn't really know the language that well at least not in a good enough not enough to hold a conversation with my coworkers but there is a universality to uh, cooking um, uh, similar you know to mathematics or something like it's there's in almost well in all western influenced kitchens there's stoves and pans and knives and cutting boards and, you know nobody wants to get burned nobody wants to get cut so there are certain ways that i've found just universally cooks conduct themselves um uh but i don't i I think I think you can definitely tell a little bit about if someone's cooking for you, you can tell a little bit about them or a lot about them uh, through the food that they make. Um, especially if you've eaten, I don't know, Benji, have you had that experience like from because um, you eat out a lot more than I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, it, it can be a little tricky because I think a lot of you know, chefs, they're, they're doing a job or, you know, cooks, uh, and they're doing the food that, uh, you know, the customer wants or that they think the customer wants, but, you know, you have some places where you can tell it's really from the heart. And there, I think you can tell something about the person cooking it or the person who came up with the menu. Um, I think you can, I think you can tell something about it, about like, no matter what, I mean, cause if someone puts, if someone's cooking for you and they burn, and this is not even in a restaurant setting, but like if they burn it or it's just thrown, like it looks like it's just thrown in a dish or something, then, you know, you can tell a little bit about that person. Like maybe they were having a bad day. Maybe they weren't, their thoughts were somewhere else and they weren't paying attention or they really just don't care. And so 
I think that you can read into a lot about the food that people serve um, into that person's life a little bit who cooked for you. Um, so I guess in that sense, I would agree that it, it could be a form of communication, you know, especially um, if you, let's say like at home uh, and you're a child and your parent is cooking for you or, and they cook for you every day, right? And um, you're expecting something like, oh, today is, you know, Friday. And usually on Friday we have, uh, you know, my mom or dad puts in a lot of effort into making something a little bit special that maybe we can have for leftovers the next day as well. Um, and then one Friday, it's just, you know, boxed macaroni and cheese. Now, what what does that mean? Like, yeah. what what are they trying to communicate, or not necessarily trying to, but what are they communicating to me through this meal? You know, did did I do something wrong? Did uh, are they in a hurry? You know, um, did our refrigerator go out? <laughs> you know, I, so I think I think that there can be communication through food, uh, but yeah. I think if, especially if you're used to um, the nuances uh, of the food that you are eating. I would say, yeah, more communication than uh, a whole language in and of itself. Um, because as you were saying, you know, that you could, um, you couldn't speak the language when you're in some of those foreign countries, but you could still be on the same page as far as uh, you know, cooking and whatnot. And, um, Certainly, there's a way for cooks to speak to their their kids or their customers or who have you. Um, so yeah, I, I think that you know, if you're tuned into it, if you're looking for it, you can often see what chefs are trying to say in the meal uh, just by eating. Um, sort of the last part of the conversation is to focus a little bit on, um, I guess, the influence of the city of Sacramento on the work that you do and kind of to jump into some topics related to the food industry here um, in the city of trees. Um, I mean, do you feel like the city itself, you know, it's geography, it's um, people, it's cultures influences the way you work? Maybe. I can go first here. I, I absolutely think it does. Um, you know, I, I was born here. I grew up 30 minutes outside and the same that we, way that we talk about a chef putting heart and soul into a meal. I feel that with my writing that, you know, this is, this feels like home here and there's, you know, uh, an interest and obligation, you know, for myself to really cover this to the best of my abilities to shine a light on all corners of the city. You know, the ones that have the bright lights and the ones that don't so much. Um, I don't know. It feels like, you know, I, I definitely feel like a Sacramento and, and um, I think that impacts my writing. I always kind of, I'll, I'll read when, you know, the New York Times comes in and does their 36 hours in Sacramento. And, it, you know, it's not meant for the people who live here and all that. But I, I just feel like living here and feeling really a part of the city, we're able to bring something different, uh, yeah, bring something um, like using this word a lot with food, but more authentic, you know. And, um, so yeah, I, I feel like I, I cover it differently than if I took a job in uh, Oklahoma City or somewhere else or what have you. Yeah. So do you, do you think, Benji, that you would, um, because you are from Sacramento, um, does that like you you also worked in uh, Am Amarillo? Amarillo, so, Texas. That's right. When you were there. Are you, were you doing food there as well? I was covering business and that included restaurants as part of that. Yeah. Okay. So when you were covering food there, did it differ like your, your, I guess your framework or the, the mindset that you had going into the dying experience and writing about it? Did that change from there to, to Sacramento? Yeah. Um, you know, I rolled up to Amarillo, Texas in my Prius with California plates and was clearly an outsider from the job and felt that way when I was reporting out there 
too. That you know, I would be talking to someone about their barbecue stand, and they'd be telling me all this stuff that was going over my head. Um, and you know, it just it, it felt different. It felt like I was parachuting, and you know, I, I knew that I wanted to move on to somewhere else from there. Uh, they probably could sense that too. It was a uh, a means to an end sort of thing. And here, you know, it feels like I'm able to put down roots a little more that, you know, I would like to be here for a long time and, uh, you know, in, invest in the community, invest in my work a little bit more, um, which I think, I, yeah. I think that may be, so that's a good example of how the region does affect yeah. your job yeah. or the work that you do. Well, and you, you know, you, you moved around a lot, it sounds like, and worked in, you know, the U.S. and abroad and, you know, different states within the U.S. How have you felt your work here differs from uh, your prior stops? Well, this is the first restaurant I've owned. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a lot different when you're working for somebody else. Um, but, I mean, well... Being a restaurant owner, uh, you know, we need, the goal is to have as many people come in the door as possible, right? Um, so with that in mind, we're in Sacramento. We need to uh, provide stuff, food, a product that um, people in Sacramento will enjoy. So I think it's in that sense, um, yeah, I think if we did Kodaiko in a different city, uh, it, it would not be the same restaurant that it is, for sure. Definitely. Um, but like you were saying, Benji, there are so many different uh, cultures represented um, culinarily in Sacramento and um and not even culinarily. For example, I, I, we have Russian friends, right? And I, and it's tough to find Russian restaurants, for example. Um, and same goes for Filipino food, you know. But I, I am also, so because of that, I, I am intrigued to know more about the Russian co cooking and the history of Russian food um so i'll go out and uh get some cookbooks um watch some watch some videos um uh, about russian culture through food and so even though i might not be able or i'm sure there are actually you know russian restaurants out there i just haven't found but uh but so i'm inspired by by that even the, even if i'm not going into you know, uh, or searching for my next favorite taco, which I do constantly. Um, I'm still inspired by uh, the cultures that are here in Sacramento. And I think, you know, as a journalist, food is one of the easiest ways to talk about those cultures without, um, you know, it is one of the easiest ways to talk about those cultures because, you know, people might not understand Russian or Tagalog or what have you, but, you know, they can put the food in their mouth and they can get a little sense of where that person's coming from or, you know, at least a little bit of a cultural experience. Um, and um, that's, that's definitely pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, speaking about local restaurants, I wanted to ask, I mean, mostly for you, Tuck, the, the effects of the pandemic on running a restaurant. I mean, how has that sort of changed the model of running a, a restaurant, I mean, both for the better and maybe for the worse too. More the better, hopefully. Well, <laughs> uh, well I mean, yeah, we're, we've been lucky enough to, like we're in, we're doing okay now. Um, we're getting by. Um, but we were only open, we opened in August, 2019. So we were only open for, uh, for less than six months before the pandemic hit really um, till the first uh, shut the lockdown shutdown. So it's it's tough to say. I mean, 
there there was no history when we were open for the, during that time. There was it was August, so we made it through the winter, and then there was no history to or like records to look back on, like to compare how it was to the year before, because you know we weren't business then. Um, so, uh, but I can tell you that before the pandemic, we really had um, no takeout business. You know, for whatever reason, people, and, uh, I mean, people just didn't think about ramen to go, I think. And we were still a new restaurant. Um, so, but now through the pandemic, we were able to get on people's radar for a takeout. Um, and we have, we spent a lot of time before opening the restaurant on uh, takeout packaging. Um, Billy and Peter, my, my partners at the restaurant, ha really had that foresight that they wanted to try and uh, make it uh, a takeout thing. Um, so we source uh, packaging that is very friendly um, to ramen, and so we keep the noodles and the broth separate and stuff. Um, so that's been one positive that's come through the pandemic. Um, another thing, and, and I'm sure people have heard about in general, just the workforce, yeah. it being harder to find workers, uh, not just for restaurants, but in almost every industry, people um, willing to work or wanting to work, eager to work. And um, I think the restaurant industry has changed a lot through the pandemic uh, and in, in that way, as one, um, being that for, I'd say, tw 2020, 2021, it was really hard to find people to work. Uh, I mean, people were getting out of the industry. I think there was a lot of time, and you mentioned it before, too, that there was like a, a lot of reflection. People had time to sit, step back and think about if they wanted to be in any given industry uh, and had time to practice or search for other fields to get into. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot a lot of the workforce in general switched up and certainly in uh, restaurants. But positive now, not that we're through the pandemic, because uh, we're not, but um, the people who left the industry um, you know, they obviously were not passionate about it enough to stay in that. Uh, but the people who have stayed or the people who are getting into it now um, are passionate about it and are uh, focused and enthusiastic um, and want to learn. At least that has been my experience uh, in the past six months or so, I'd say. Um, so that's another positive that has come out of the pandemic. And, you know, unfortunately, there's been a lot of negatives as well, of course. Um, but uh, we were able to make it through and um, are finding that. Benji, I know in the reporting that you do and in uh, the bees reporting in general around food, I mean, there's a lot of um, time goes into restaurant openings, but also notifying, you know, um, readers about restaurant closings. I mean, how have you seen the sort of the landscape shift over the last few years in terms of restaurants in Sacramento? I mean, I think downtown has been hit the hardest. Um, there, you know, there's no substitute for the tens of thousands of state workers that started working from home during the pandemic, and a lot of them haven't come back to the office full time. Those rents are pretty high, as Takumi can probably tell you, and you know. People aren't coming in, I think, as much for lunch or post-work drinks or what have you, uh, the way they were. Certainly, you know, in 2020, when things were hardcore shut down, that's when we saw the worst of it. That's when we mm -hmm. saw a lot of places, uh, Ambrosia, Buzz Buffet, you know, those kind of long time downtown places mm -hmm. closing up. Um, now, you know, places close, businesses run their course. Sometimes it's a financial situation. Sometimes it's the owners ready to retire or move on or do something else. Um, but we're having a ton of places open too. I just did a story that, you know, 35 new restaurants opened around the region last month. And I don't have the numbers on how many closed, but I don't think it was that many. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like we're at a point where the pandemic is not over, but 
we're starting to see more confidence as far as businesses, you know, getting going and opening and, um, you know, they, they feel more comfortable doing so than, uh, than 2020 or early 2021. Um, it's great to see. I mean, that kind of brings me to the last part of our conversation. Um, I mean, we talked a little bit about the pandemic and I love this picture that you, you sent through the top, uh, but kind of thoughts on the future, you know, um, I mean, what are you what are you both looking forward to? I mean, in terms of um, perhaps the growth of the industry or the change of the industry. I mean, what creative projects lie ahead for you? I mean, yeah, what are you thinking about in relation to food, Sacramento, and the work that you do? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think Sac has really had some tremendous growth in its dining scene over the last five or ten years, and in the last five years in particular, it's got a lot of recognition for that. You know. I, I didn't love the methodology, but Michelin coming out here and awarding Big Gourmands and Stars, you know, put Sacramento dining on a map in a way that it hadn't been done in the past. And they're still coming out here. I think we're also seeing a uh, growing appreciation for the diversity of cuisines and diversity of cooks that we have here. Um, you know, the Farm and Fork Festival is going on right now, and there's always the Tower Bridge dinner, which is most exclusive dinner in Sacramento. But this year they're having an event that's going to have like, you know, 18 or 20 cooks from all different ethnic backgrounds cooking together, you know, representing the West end of downtown Sacramento from what it was way back in the day with, you know, the Japantown, Chinatown, uh, a black jazz feel sort of thing. Um, you know, that's like a, going to be a marquee event at the Farm and Fork Festival this year. And, um, yeah, really looking that, forward. I think they're, you know, bringing that to the center stage to the under the bright lights. I think there's going to be more of that going forward, which I think is a great thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad you brought up the Tower Bridge, um, dinner because Tuck, you, you kind of contributed to that this year, right? Yeah. Uh, my first, uh, I had then had never. Uh, participated in it in any way before um, and I was yeah lucky enough to be asked to do an appetizer um, for it and I we ran one of the uh, one of the pod kitchens during the full dinner service as well and it was really cool to see and be a part of that experience um, yeah seeing food on that on that scale for a thousand people uh, certainly never seen it done that way before and it was really impressive. Um, yeah, it was done really well. It was really smooth. And I think the food was really good. So, uh, but also, Benji, what you're talking about with the West End revival that's coming up, um, I, I'm going to be a part of that as well. And uh, that is something that I am really uh, looking forward to. And it's a, it's a part of um, Sacramento history that uh, doesn't really get acknowledged or it doesn't really not doesn't really get talked about much you know um yeah basically um those groups of people um who have been there for generations just got kicked out just got pushed out their homes got leveled their businesses got leveled and now we have that area um uh, west of the capitol mall and that whole downtown corridor um that is where it's standing where their homes and businesses used to be. Um, and yeah, so I'm really looking forward to that, um, bringing more, hopefully to bring more light to um, that portion of our history in Sacramento. And as um, for myself, as a Japanese American, um, I think it's really important. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, it's as successful as the Tower Bridge dinner was. I, uh, I think they're announcing the, the roster of chefs for that tomorrow for the West End dinner, but it's like an all-star team of chefs of color in Sacramento. It's really impressive, um, and I, I think it'll be a great event. Um, I also think that, you know, in throughout the U.S., there was sort of a, a look in the mirror for a lot of people during 2020 with the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, and protesting over George Floyd's death and um, you know, the restaurant industry 
did a lot of looking in the mirror as well. And I think that there's really, you know, there's a renewed focus on addressing things like the leveling of the West End and, you know, like the displacing of, of all those people who used to live there, and, um, you know, celebrating the, the culture of that in this event, but also um, reckoning with Sacramento's history that's, you know, not always pretty. I mean, yeah, I, mean I, think, yeah. I think that has something to do also, um, uh, Houghton, about has to do also with the, uh, the future of the food industry. Um, yeah, I, I think not just um, inclusiveness um, and, you know, because the, the restaurant industry has a reputation um, and the history, I should say, of being um, misogynistic and um, like very ego driven and um, not just, I mean, it's not just a reputation, it, it's the truth. You know, that I've worked in kitchens like that for sure. Um, and it's definitely an environment that is, uh, can be hostile. Uh, and I think now, not I think, there is a huge push in the industry to change that and it really has changed. That is another thing that really has changed through the pandemic, uh, is just the restaurant culture um, uh, in the front of the house and the back of the house. Um, yeah, I mean, and I think that has a lot to do with the younger generations that are coming up in uh, the restaurant industry, uh, being more aware of social uh, norms and wanting to change things that they, uh, didn't that they don't feel was right you know so um also uh pay and benefits and quality of life are things that used to be at least in the kitchen kind of a point of pride like yeah you know i work 70 hours a week but i only get paid for for 40 hours a week and you know I, I barely made rent last month like those were discussions that you know i've had <laughs> in the past with coworkers, and it wasn't like a complaint it was like a like yeah you're going through it too you know yeah we're doing it too it was like all right this is, it was kind of like yeah this is awesome <laughs> to put in the hard work and to be able to persevere and to make it through uh, and still survive um yeah but the, but that culture is changing totally and we have um a, a word we are um when we opened we wanted to have a model uh, a fairly untraditional model in that um we uh the front of the house pools all their tips and we have our cooks get tipped out as well um a portion of uh, the front of the house tips in, in an effort to um bring equality to the wage discrepancy or the earnings discrepancy, I should say, between the wait staff and the cooks traditionally. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, uh, you know, you, you, you see now more often a surcharge to tip out the back of the house, the cooks a little more, or you'll, you'll hear about Starbucks stores voting on unionizing or whatnot. And I think that you know, yeah, there is uh, a push in the direction of uh, workers' rights, you could call it, I guess, um, in, in a lot of industries, but definitely in the restaurant or food industry. I mean, that's a pretty good place to end, sort of some some hope for um, continued positive change into the future. I was just checking in the chat. I mean, lots of Kodaiko fans watching, um, but it's like you both answered all the questions, so no questions in the chat. So I guess I'll kind of round out with one last question. I mean, speaking about the future, what lies in wait for you both for dinner this evening? <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, couldn't wait. So as I had uh, stopped and got a burger from Shake Shack Perfect. before we started here this evening. And <laughs> so that was my dinner. It was pretty good. Too. Not pretty as good, good as dinner, though. No. Yeah. <laughs> Just different, different, but good. I grill up some chicken with some, you know, 
array of Middle Eastern spices the other night uh, and some veggies, and I'll either reheat that or see if my coworkers are still drinking at Sackyard Beer Tap Room and yeah. head over there. And they have a uh, an Argentinian food truck over there. As I say it out loud, that's kind of sounding more appealing. So <laughs> yeah. Nice. That sounds pretty good. Well, I want to thank you both for taking the time to be here this evening. Uh, I hope to be able to do some more of these types of programs in the future, bringing sort of you know uh, journalism and writing and you know the arts and food and restaurants together. So thank you both for being open to kicking it off for the first time. And yeah, I hope to be in touch soon. Thank you, Houghton. Take care, guys. Jeez. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you, everyone, for watching as well. well thanks, everybody, for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed that program. Um, don't forget to grab that Art Interactive magazine or check out our website uh, for more upcoming programs in the fall. Take care. Have a great evening.